is this just fantasy? Sure, why not? It's Fawfred and the Grey Mouser. We're back with the second issue of one of my favorite fantasy series of all time. And we got two short stories in this one. And both are really interesting. One is just like a really great short story, like comic short story. And we know that Mike Mignola is very capable of doing a short story justice in comic form. And then the other one is just really fascinating in its scope and what it's trying to accomplish. Uh, we talked about the first issue already, which is the classic story, Il Met and Lankmar. And this is the second edition that they put out. And all of this is collected in the Fawford and the Grey Mouser trade paperback and the newly minted Omnibus. That includes both this series and the earlier Sword of Sorcery series. And I think that's worthwhile to pick up. But anyway, let's get past this great cover by Mignola and let's see what we have in this issue. So another great first page. And it just, it feels, I don't know, there's something very literary about coming at it this way. And what I like is that this, this is the story called The Circle Curse. It starts immediately after the last one ended. So if you don't recall, in the last story, the titular heroes sadly lost their love interests to a sorcerer who used like rats to eat them. It's really horrible, but also a really great issue. And then they wreaked vengeance on the Thieves Guild. But then the last issue saw them walking away from uh, Lankmar. And this issue starts right where that last one ended. So we have this awesome view of Lankmar, great use of shadows, and just just creates this image of this very congested, living on top of each other city. So here we have our two heroes leaving town, and we have a funny little bit with these guards who are like, who, you know, what f only bad men and fools would... Willingly leave the grandest city at this, you know, of Newhan and, you know, like, or who's that leaving at this hour? And we get them just feeling very disheartened and just, yeah, really, really can't state enough how much I love the, the line work here, just, and also just the basic storytelling. Really great. Uh, Al Williamson inks over Mike Mignola's art. And something that I really love is this entity showing up. So we have this great silhouette image of them walking away and then this bizarre looking hut on very long, skinny legs. And it somebody calls from it to get their attention. And I love this great thunder strike. And again, nobody does better silhouettes than, and does more with silhouettes than Mike Mignola. And we get this bizarre, magical figure. And I, I get very much like a Baba Yaga vibe from this entity that lives in this house that seems to walk, that seems to traverse and move. And essentially what... And I love this panel right here. Look at this panel where they are, you know, separated by a, by a panel just to, for the passage of time, but yet... It's still one continuous image. I love stuff like that. And I love the design of this. It's, it's very simple, but just still evocative and eerie, mysterious. Really great. And this thing, basically this entity who is called Shielba of the Eyeless Face, which, what a name, uh, essentially tells them that they are cursed to always return to Lankmar. And that no matter where they go, they will always come back, even though they're both vowing that to never return because they lost their great loved ones. 
uh, to this place and they feel empty even though they sort of got revenge. And so neither one's like, we're never going to come back here. And Shilba's like, no, no, no. You will always come back here. You're, you're cursed to come back here, essentially. And that's, that's essentially like the, the start of this issue. And I just love that this thing walks away somehow. What a cool, mystical thing of a thing. I love it. Uh, and great, great text design for this thunder and lightning and just yeah such great work with all of this design yeah great figure work amazing yeah so easy to differentiate characters with the silhouettes he gives them so then the rest of this story is like this really neat travelogue that covers several years of their life and these various adventures that they're on going around the world and i just it's really great color work by van volkenberg and just really great line art i love this crazy giant rat sculpture you know and them taking these horses and then stealing these ho st trading these horses for these camels by these rich folks that are just kind of passed out and then traveling across a desert and they think they're in one city, but they're actually in another one. But, like, it's just... We get such a great variety of places. It's called so, the Year of the Leviathan, which, what a cool way to denote that. And then we have a great fantasy map here. And just such great... I mean, le the lettering is what I'm obsessed with with this. I love the little face here on the sun, but just, I love this lettering. And the big scorpion over the desert. Yeah, it's it's absolutely wonderful. And there's not a lot to it, but yet it's so it's so evocative of like an ancient map. It's great. And then we have just yeah, them coming across all these different folks and you know, people seem to have like magical abilities, like making these pyramids float and then floating themselves. I love these little dogs, uh, these beautiful little birds, these parrots. You know, them going up up north to kind of where Fawford is from. And it's just, it's such a great little travelogue. And, you know, we get, we come across even, we even have some great emotional moments because Fawford comes across his village and it's been destroyed and not by really anything great it's just he calls them ice gnomes and they have seemingly killed his mother the the his first kind of you could say wife like his his wife from up here and the child that they had that he never met it's like yeah, shockingly tragic. A little skull in there. And again, I love these moments where he pops some details out, but keeps the rest in shadow. It simplifies things, but also allows to have some specificity in there. It's just really great. Also love how his beard's getting bigger, the lo you know, the longer they're out here. But yeah, just a bit of a, tra a, a more more tragedy. And they even comment on that, that like we have more, you know, more tragedies to try to forget. And then they come up on the year of the dragon. They they're in a new place, and they're they're fighting like gladiators for some rich guy. And I just yeah, there's so much great design work going on, landscape design. It's all inspired by you know stuff from the real world because it kind of has to be. That's all. That's every artist's reference point. But he still finds ways to make it feel fantastical. You know, and then they come to a city that, you know, Mouser thinks that he's from. But it's just this town of of beggars and, just, you know, look at that landscape. It just tells you everything you need to know on that first panel. You don't need to read anything. And Mouser's not pleased with this notion. And, like, there's no real evidence that he is born here. He, this is just what he's heard. 
So he's kind of a of, a, of an orphan. And then and another year goes by and they're street performers. And I, just, I love the variety of their life and they always stick together. They're part of this street fair. It's, it's wonderful. And I, yeah, and then he uses some beer to, to wake him up. He thinks he's been addled by the sun. And Mung Jungo. Great stuff. Yeah, I just I I, I love their repartee. I love and, and I love the brevity with which these this story is being told. And then, yeah, they they come upon all these all these different places. And then, out here in the wilderness, they are. They they are basically met with another mystical being. And they're basically this mystical being is like, you need to go back to Lankmar. And they're like, well, we don't like we like you. He's there, and his logic is, you've been everywhere, but you haven't been able to forget. You need to go back to Lankmar, where it all began. And they look the light, and there's nothing there. And I look, I love these little bits here because I think it's it's both funny and also interesting. It says, thus ended the first encounter of our heroes with Ningobble of the Seven Eyes. And that's similar to the the other entity that they met in the house that walks. And I just, yeah, fantastic. And then here they are back on their way, finally returning to Lankmar. And our, our entity is, is more than happy to chide them for it. And then in they go. Who's entering at this hour? Just great. And that's it. That's it. I mean, and it, it's interesting because, yeah, there's not... It's There's both a lot and not a lot to the story. And frankly, I don't need a lot to... this to uh, to uh, For a short story to work for me. And I just love that we get just such a grand sweep of the world. We get a grand look of it with these characters who we've already come to, to get to know and to like... And, and yet we end up right back where we, we started. And I just, I think it really works. I think it's, I mean, props, of course, to Fritz Lieber for a great short story, but also I think just a great adaptation. And also, I love all this. Look at, look at how he simplified that city that we saw at the beginning. I mean, you could call it squiggles. I guess you could, but it's still, it simplifies in such a great way. And I'm never gonna, I'm never gonna ignore uh, like details like that, just because that just helps me feel engrossed in the story. All right, now on to the second story of this set, and this issue, it's the Howling Tower. And so this is more of a proper short story, or not necessarily that the first one was improper, but just that it is. A little more focused. It's it's not a, like a travel log like this other one. It's more. This is a a single adventure that they go on, and it's really interesting. And you could, I feel like, in my mind, I could see this being a part of their of their years of travels outside of Lankmar. And I just, I also think it's it's a fascinating way to to order these stories is to have this kind of little travel log as the next story after Ilmet and Lankmar, and then to come across the Howling Tower as, like, this is an adventure they had while they were out there, or, or whatever. But yeah, just let's start off here with an amazing no uh, external nocturnal shot. And our friends here are camped out, and they're in the wilderness, and they hear a howling out in the and Fawford is convinced it is just wolves or something like that but Mouser's listening to their guide and the guide's like there's this tower out there where the howling comes from and yeah he's their their guide that they've they've paid to to help them and yeah he's like that he's like it keeps getting louder and and men vanish uh, and anybody who's been to that tower that has never seen again. And so that's where, that's what our, our setup is. And 
Crawford is just, he's, he's, he's the skeptic. He's the skeptic of the two. And when they wake up in the morning, he is gone. And just a spear is left. And so they, they travel along. And it's not really necessarily said where they're going. They just, they need to navigate this land. And they're, it's not known to them. And so that's why they had a guide. Uh, so they just, they keep traveling along. And then when they camp for the night again, they are able to see a tower at the dist in the distance. And... Again, Fawford is very convinced that it is just not a, it's not a, it's just animals. It's, it's, it's a physical threat. And I just, I loved how, I love how this story is drawn, of course, but also love how it's paced. It sets up our characters as, as opposed in, in what they, they think about it. And yeah, we just get some really great panels here really great faces and just shows the the differing dynamics of the two and yeah he's we're we're ready to get the kind of a uh, our, our our key moment here which is Fawford goes missing and so he has to Mouser has to step it up to try to rescue his friend and he he tries to head there as fast as possible to this tower. And we're getting I'm getting kind of a like plains of Africa kind of vibe, just with like the shape of that tree and the kind of the flatness of it, but not necessarily, but it's still it it's a different landscape, which I appreciate. Appreciate the detail. Also, I do know that Mike Mignola loves drawing rocks. And he's doing a hell of a job doing that. And a great little in, and I love Mignola's insert inserted silent panels that just add texture, and I love this ominous vulture thrown in here. And so yeah, he he makes his way to the tower, and he's like, it's smaller than I thought, and there's like used to be like a village underneath it. Just yeah, what a cool set of panels yeah i yeah i guess i'm not i don't know am i not demanding enough of, or I, I don't i'm just very pleased i just love a simple story like this and i yeah look at the, i love the coloring of this the painting of that really nice yeah like all the coloring of this this book is is so great i love the the red and reds and grays in here so wonderful and yeah i love this 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 setup here where we get a, a medium shot, a close up, and where he's where he's headed, and the shot from inside, and then we hear a, a little signal, a sound here. That's that's he's darting forward from, and we see a fallen stone, and like a large one. And then here we. You know, see again the inverse. There's a lot of great cool like panel or like camera angle flipping. Anyway, what I find fascinating is part of me as an artist probably and it's maybe maybe it's just a difference of of instinct. But my instinct would have been to put the him him standing like basically shift these two over and put uh, the fallen panel, this one, right here. So it was like boom, boom, boom. It's a, it's just it's it's a sequence. But I understand why he didn't do that because if he didn't include this panel where we see where he's headed, we don't know. We just cut to he's looking. And he's 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 gotten an inclination, and then he's just outside. I guess we could just with the context of the other pages assume that he's headed. He's found a doorway, but we don't if we don't see a doorway anywhere. If we had seen a doorway, maybe somewhere in this panel, 
or if it was suggested, you could probably go without this panel necessarily. But I'm without it, without seeing the doorway here, I understand why you would want to insert panel where it's like, okay, you, like, you can see where he's headed. Um, but I feel like with context clues, you could have done without. But I feel like this is just a little bit more illustrative. It's, it's, it's letting the, the viewer know more uh, about what's, what's happening rather than showing them less and letting them, making them infer. And in any case... It still works this way because then it's it's a cliffhanger. It's like, oh, well, what what's what's happening? And then boom, because just because it's a similar like perspective on that panel, it makes me think that it should go right next to the others. But the fact that it doesn't doesn't detract from it. Obviously, it's just another way to have continuity between one page and another. Love this close up of him, and then I really love. I don't know the the way that magic is depicted, and source and sorcery is depicted in this comic, is so interesting and dark, and unpleasant, and I think that's something that I really like and even respect about Fritz Lieber's perspective on the use of magic in fantasy. Is all too often it's just, it's an easy replacement for you could say a gun or a, a heightened weapon or a plot device or a or it's too easy of a solution for something and with this it's so gross like look at all these fucking bones hanging from the the roof here and then look at this little wizard's room all these skeletons and, and and like the corpse of an alligator or crocodile hanging from the roof and all these nasty old books like i mean these books look amazing this panel is just great all these scrolls the, the reagents and such it's just it's a fantastic panel and it's so and also i love the darkness in it because it's like there's more to it but yet we don't see all of it because it's dark and we can't tell. And I love all these little insert shots that we get of this place where we get the impression that he's getting from it. With, uh, you know, the Mouser's getting is that, well, what's at, what's at stake here? What's, what's going on? And so I just love that. But yeah, I love that with Lieber's like, no, magic is, it's, it's, it's weird in the, in the, in the classical sense. And also, in just it's strange it's it's mysterious and i think that's the other great aspect of it is that he keeps it mysterious and he also keeps it very like like it's you're doing something potentially wrong just by engaging with magic like magic itself is this corrupting force which maybe you could say it's an allegory for power of, of a kind you know and you know it's not super uh insightful for me to put that to it but basically yeah that it's you know if you're 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 vying for this extreme version of power it's going to you, know, you have to do something wrong to get it yeah and then we find our our fawford and he's bound up almost like a mummy covered in bandages and he's got his sword in hand but it's like, what the hell is going on? And then uh, Fafer, or Mouser tries to wake him up, but he's not waking. And we get the, uh, the guide is sitting here, but his bandages are covered in blood. And I love that it's like blackened because there's so much blood, but we still get the inkling that there's blood. And so he's, he's already dead, bound in bandages. Again, so much great use of blacks here. And also great character design. And great, just, you know, throwing these little cuts in there so that his silhouette, the part that's blackened out, stands out. And, but yet his legs and his lower torso can get pulled away from the blackness here. So amazing. And, you know, just all this little stuff hinted at around here. All these bones and everything. It's just perfectly simplified. And then, yeah, he, he's, he's trying to find the architect of this, this madness. 
And a great use of light here. I love that on these little silhouettes. But he's fine. He's finding his way, and you get these. He's, I love these little edition of snorts in there from Fawford. Because of course that big guy, he's yeah, he's gonna snore. And then here we come across the wizard himself. He's kind of enchanting to himself, and Mouser grabs the light and threatens him with it. And I love, what a great face. What a great face on this man. And I just love that he, he was so convinced that he crushed him with the rock, with the boulder, that he's like, no, you're dead. And it's also clear that he's kind of grown delirious and he's been alone and he kind of spills the beans on stuff. And I get, you know, I feel like making him kind of a little... Like, he's a recluse, and so he's a little crazy, a little uh, unhinged. I feel like that helps to guide his chatter on what has, got, what has transpired and what he has done and why he has done it. And I just love the simplicity of these panels. And I'm sure Mignola loved it because... He was able to focus on these great figures and not on the rest. And I, I think I love that he throws this light in there to focus or, or to, to signify that it, it's, that is the only light source and is through that that we get everything. And so and all the other information is, is not important. And I, I appreciate that as far as like just visually how to handle this scene. So great. And yeah, he is, yeah, he's convinced that he should, he should be dead. And then it's through this sequence that we learn who he is and that basically he was born magical or born with, with a connection to magic and unsettled people. But then he used magic to kill people his enemies until there was essentially nobody left in town. So this guy has been a son of a bitch for a real long time. Yeah. And I love these, these wild dog images. It looks like a, like a hyena or something right here. Yeah. I also love that this, this place was once pristine, but this guy ruined all that. And I love like the, the, yeah, it's vaguely kind of Egyptian like headdress here. And yeah, he's yeah, just such a great panel. And anyway, what eventually transpired was that he yeah he, he used magic in a subtle way to kill everybody, and then the only thing left were the dogs, and he he tricked them all into the cellar. And then lock them in there and let them eat each other. And, but yeah, and he's like, he heard the howling for a while, but then it would dissipate. But then at a certain point, the howling grew louder. And so it would keep him up. And when he would go to check, he'd just see these bones, but he would hear the howls at night. And it didn't go away. In fact, it grew louder. And essentially, what he deduced is that the spirits of the dogs and potentially the other victims are still present and want revenge upon him. And so it's really creative because basically what he does is he tricks vis travelers to come inside. He then gives them a potion that essentially forces their spirit out of their body. And then the ghosts of the hounds attack them, attack those spirits instead of him. And when he realized that the bodies or of the people were getting too mangled too quickly, he started bandaging them preemptively so that they can hold, hold together longer. It's horrible and devious and evil and it's pretty incredible concept. And what, you know, and he's yeah, and, Fa and Mouser's just like, that's fucking, that's fucked up. You got to wake up my friend. And 
he is, yeah, basically he's like, there's no antidote. The only thing I can do is give you the same potion and so that you can essentially help your friend fight off the dogs. And that's it. And what I find really fascinating is that Mouser is is tr is kind of in this locked in this battle of wits with this guy, and as we can see, that he's starting to bleed uh, through his bandages a little. So he's been fighting him off, but he can't last forever. And this son of a bitch tries to kill Mouser, but then Mouser's like, "Well, this this drink is either poison or." It's the potion, and you're gonna have to drink it with me. And it's pretty brilliant on his part. I love, yeah, I love the cleverness of of Mouser, and I also love that he's facing off against just yeah this real absolute shit heel. Also, just great choreography here, great panels, great color. Love these side by side. It looks great. And yeah, just just wonderful. As far as stellar storytelling goes. And I love how this, this howl goes based almost entirely across both pages. And definitely across here. But just, yeah, it seems great. And so then, yeah, he makes the wizard take it. And then he drinks it himself. And the spirits all pop out. And it's, yeah. It's, so now both of our main characters are essentially ghosts who have to fight against the the dead dogs and yeah now we're in the spirit world so what what a cool transition and so they've entered the spirit world and they you know fighting for their lives and i, I love the color change it looks great and it's yeah and they're like this is this is the best that they can do but what's fantastic is as they fight, the dogs notice the, the the architect of their demise and switch tactics and start chasing him. And then as they watch him get torn apart, they see that there are men in the in the group of dogs as well. Yeah, I love this fade out here. This fade out of, of basically him getting torn apart in the spirit world. Yeah, was, yeah, what a great, what a great transition. And they wake up, and they're they're alive, but he's dead, and yeah, and they they want to go back to a place where what's what what's alive or what's dead stays dead. But who knows if there's any place in the world they live in that that's true. And of course, we got a great last panel here. This, it's not even a panel. It's just a, like a pinup. I would hang this on my wall. I would want a, a, a large scale print of this. This is so great. These skulls hanging in this tree. The vulture. It's probably an alternate cover or something there. It's, like, it's too cool not to include. The skulls in the, in the roots here. Yeah, this is yeah, this is the stuff that fantasy is for me. This this these evocative images, and this comic is full of them. Not not a not a shallow piece in the mix. Boom. So that's it. Issue two in the can. Just love it, and I I can't recommend this series enough. Absolutely seek out the Mignola and Chaikin and Williamson and Van Valkenburg adaptation of Fawford and the Grey Mouser, released by Epic Comics, which was an imprint of Marvel at the time. Uh, although Dark Horse has now released the omnibus that has all of the Fawford and Grey Mouser adaptations by both, I guess, DC and Marvel, but both by Howard Chicken. And it's just, just wonderful stuff. Also, please read the books or the short stories. I don't know. They seem like they're kind of hard to come by in, in the wild, but I've managed to find some copies. 
but uh, they're great short stories, and I hope that Fitzlieber continues to be read. And if you like this and you're interested in new stuff that's like it, then I highly recommend my comic, Sidequesters. And this is Fetch Me the Lizard Man, the first volume of the series, and it's also the first complete story, all collected in one place. And I have a set of characters who are who are very different, similar to Fawford and the Grey Mouser, uh, but to stick together and go on adventures and such. And that's that's basically what this is, except my my Fawford is a, a giant lizard man, and my Mouser is a uh, badass with an axe. So there, there you have it. Um, you can buy this on my website, or you can read it on Global Comics. I also will recommend, if you like side questers or if you like short stories, I have my two Haxon anthologies, which are short stories about magic users. So similar to The Howling Tower, and they're kind of dark and eerie and mysterious, and they all take place in the same universe as the as side questers. So, and even they even appear in a couple of them. So, these can be bought on my website, and also you can read them on Global Comics as well. And just for fun, I will also recommend Three Panel Origin and Three PO Comics. These are my superhero parody comics where I create a character and tell their origin in three panels. And it's basically like The Tick or Mystery Men or something like that. And this collects the first three years in print format, and it's they're the best they've ever looked in this. And then this is short stories based on some of those characters. So yeah, if you like superhero-y stuff, that's available on my website. Anyway, I'm done here. Long live Fawford and the Great Mouser.